morning. Doing just fine. Good morning. Hey, Ed. Good morning. Morning, Ed. Hi, everybody. This is Ray. Hey, Ray. How are you, Steve? I'm well. There you are. Hey, Ray. Hello. Hey, is that Joe? How are you? No. Yep. Steve shamed me into joining. Uh, <laughs> it was an offer. It was an invitation. You didn't have to. You're retired. You can do whatever you want. I hope you enjoyed the flight. <laughs> Francois, how we doing? All right. I'm going to turn off my camera. I don't think we have to use cameras, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, it's 8.30. I suspect we're going to have a few more folks popping in. Robert Leaf said he's going to be joining us. Um, but our YouTube link is going. I currently have 19 people on the call. It looks like most of our subcommittee is here. Um, a few guests. So uh, in a second, I'll go down the list and uh, have everybody say hello and what your affiliation is. Uh, it's not going to be in any particular order because it's uh, uh, alphabetizing people based on their whatever first part of their name is that they logged in as. Maybe first name, maybe last name. Anybody got any issues before we start? Francois, is your, uh, is your computer working now, your audio? Uh, okay. I don't know. But Francois is still on the webinar. Uh, Scott. Herbert, yeah. I see you. Let's hear your. Can you say something? Yes, I'm here. Good. We got you. Got you. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, Peter, if you want to go ahead and welcome everybody, and then I'll go down the list. Sure. Um, Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's sunny and bright here in New Jersey, and um, welcome to the uh, spring meeting of the, I call it the GMAC meeting. Steve says the MAC meeting. So I will turn things over to Steve to deal with the introductions. I will be turning over the chairmanship uh, shortly and bowing out. Go ahead, Steve. All right. So on the call, um, just go ahead and, and uh, give us a short who you are, who you're with. I got Amy Schuler. Hi, everyone. It's Amy Schuler, assessment scientist with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Ben Landry. Uh, hi, my name is Ben Landry, uh, member of the GMAC, uh, representing um, the Menhaden. Coalition of the Gulf of Mexico, but I'm employed by um, Ocean Fleet Services, which is the contracted harvesting company for Omega Person. Caller number nine. Any idea who that is? Not me. No. Okay. Carrie? 
Hi, I'm um, Kerry Jalpy. I'm the state representative from Texas with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, um, based out of the Port Arthur Field Station. Chris? Hey, this is Chris Swanson. Um, I'm an assessment scientist and on the uh, GMAC for uh, state representative of Florida, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, I'm based out here in St. Peter. All right, Dave Donaldson. I'm Dave Donaldson. I'm the executive uh, director of the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, and uh, glad to, glad to be on with you guys and hear, hear your discussions today. <coughs> David Cresson. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is David Cresson. I'm the executive director of the Coastal Conservation Association, Louisiana. Uh, glad glad to join as a guest today. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, and that reminds me, for, for guests who are on the call, if you find that you have a question, you're, you're free to join in and, and ask those questions. It'd be easiest to probably use the chat window, and I'll keep track of that and see when, you, uh, when people want to ask a question. Um, so let's see. Uh, Benson, I see you just joined. You want to introduce yourself quick? Yes, I'm happy Child. to. Apologies, I was on mute. Um, yes, Benson Childs. I work with conservation groups on uh, Menhaden issues in the Atlantic, and I'm, uh, I'm following the, uh, the, the Gulf efforts closely. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Debbie McIntyre. Uh, Debbie McIntyre, I'm staff here at Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission. All right, Ed. All right. Can you hear me? Ed, are you there? Yep, we can hear you now. I'm Ed Swindell. I'm uh, just a consultant uh, for the Manhattan industry. Am I? Company as Gulf, Gulf, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Gulf Marine <laughs> process. Thank you. All right. Uh, Francois is having some trouble. Um, both his. Hey, can he, uh, can you hear me on the phone? Please. I can hear you better. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully that works. Good, and you can I'm see fine. the webinar? Yes, I can. I'm Francois Cattell, West Bank Fishing uh, out of Empire, Louisiana. Excellent. All right, uh, Jason Adrians. Jason Adrians, Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries, uh, Louisiana representative on the GMAC. Jason Socher. Uh, Jason Soche, uh, MDMR, Office of Marine Fisheries, just tuning in and as a guest. I always say your last name wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's close enough. <laughs> Jason, uh, uh, John Mareska. Uh, John Mareska, Alabama Marine Resources out of Dolphin Island. <laughs> Joe. Uh, Joe Smith, uh, happily retired uh, biologist from uh, NIMS Beaufort Lab and a former member of the MAC uh, representing the Southeast Fishery Science Center. Good to have you. Marin. Hey, everybody. I'm Marin Hawk from the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, just, just here as a guest. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. Peter. Peter Hemchak, uh, fishery scientist representing Omega Protein. Ray. Ray. Are you there, Ray? 
Yeah, I am. Sorry. It looks like I have two mutes. There you um, go. All right. So uh, my name is Ray Morocco. I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, I'm, I'm the one who oversees the commercial fishery sampling for the Gulf of Maine Fishery. All right. Ryan. 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 Brian Bradley, Executive Director of Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United. Thank you, Ryan. Scott? Yes, it's Scott Herbert with Daybrook Fisheries, and I am on the committee. All right. Trevor. Trevor Moncrief, Ben Fish Bureau, Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. All right. And Catherine. I am Catherine Wilhelm here as a guest, master's student in Dr. Robert Leap's lab. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And as I said, uh, Robert will be joining us uh, in a little while. He, he has a, a prior appointment. So um, we'll go ahead and, and keep moving. Uh, you've, you've got the agenda. I've sent it to the, the members. Um, Mr. Chairman, I guess we just have a couple of motions here we, for the next two items, if you want to run us through those. Hey. All right. So for the um, adoption of the agenda, I have a request. Uh, Robert Leith is not on the... Uh, I had to talk to Robert uh, to speak briefly on a census funded project specific to Gulf Menhaden. Uh, we'll put that under other business, item number 11. If Robert doesn't get to join us, uh, I can give a quick, it's a quick update. Um, Tempest funded this project in December of 2020. That's the only addition I have. How do you spell Tempest is S-C-E-M-F-I-S, -S, all in caps. S C E M. F I S stands for Science Center for Marine Fisheries. I've lost a lot of typing skills during the uh, pandemic. I apologize. <laughs> Any other changes to the agenda? Well, hearing none, I guess I guess we'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as modified. So moved. Second. Second was Jason. I think. Oh, okay. Greg. You got it. Greg right second. Stated. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to the minutes. Uh, the minutes uh, from September twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Anybody have any uh, corrections, additions, uh, exceptions, misspellings? We'll take anything at this point. I have none. I did make the change, Scott, that you had recommended that uh, we had boarded on there twice in the in the participation, but that's been fixed. Um, this is Ben Landry. I move we approve the minutes of the September 2020 meeting. This is Ray Morocco, second. Okay, so the minutes are approved as presented. And then now we're on the election of the chair. And Steve, I'll defer to you since you know the process. I'm on my way out here. But with the state yes, sir. All right, as, so let's as the, uh, Okay. Yep. At, at the fall meeting, um, we arrived at the uh, nomination point. It's a state representative. Uh, the way that the uh, rotation works, we go from our federal partner to an industry partner to a state partner. Um, as far as the the seat, it is the seat which is the position so it does not matter who is in that seat at the time so uh, Mississippi 
was the logical rotation. Trevor had indicated he would be willing to uh, take the seat, but he's the proxy for Matt Hill, and that kind of brought some questions, so we deferred it. So at this time, unless there's uh, any objections to having uh, Trevor serve as the chair, I think we'll we'll pick that back up from October and, and work that in as a motion. Does somebody want to move that? Well, Steve, did, uh, Trevor, were you able to talk with Matt? Is, is he going to continue to serve on it, or are you going to be become the full member for Mississippi? Uh, I'd anticipate that, you know, some point in the future, I'll be the full member. For now, Matt's still the, Matt's the uh, representative, officially. Okay. Well, I will make the motion that we nominate the Mississippi representative or proxy to serve as the chair for the Menhaden Advisory Committee meeting. I'll second that. Any objection? Hearing none, I think we have a new chairman. Congratulations. Are you ready to take on the mantle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll do the best. You know, I, really regret, I really regret not having been able to uh, preside over an in-person meeting during my short tenure. So, uh, well, I'll well, have to stick for two more years. <laughs> well, as our past chair, I'd hate to think that a lot of this was tied to you, uh, all these all these virtual and pandemics. So maybe this is the beginning of a new age, Peter. Okay. <laughs> Did, uh, all right. I'll talk about the cupcake tradition. I thought it was donuts. To bring cupcakes for everyone. Well, I'm fine with that, too. Next meeting. Hopefully we'll be in person. Trevor can take care of that. On it. Um, I did send out a few meeting items beforehand to the, to mostly to the membership. Um, one of them was the, uh, the roster. If you have any changes to that roster, this is just a housekeeping item before we get going. Um, please send those corrections to Debbie and I, and we'll make sure that we get those taken care of and, and fixed so that we've got good points of contact, emails, um, phone numbers, all of that information. And I think we'll probably have to put a proxy here under, uh, under Matt's. It'll be confusing with a, with a new chair. Um, FYI, guys, I'll be sending Debbie and Steve an email, but I just have an address change for that, so there will be another adjustment. Okay, thank you. Steve, this is uh, John. I have one question uh, related to the our new chair. How long will they actually serve? Is he just serving for this meeting, or will he? Are we going to nominate a new chair in October again? Well, the nomination would be at the end of the meeting in October. So he is going to preside over the March meeting starting now and the October meeting until such time as we elect a chair again. So that's the normal routine is that he'll be chair for this year. All right. Thanks. And if you want to move to elect him as chair for life in October, you are certainly welcome to. That's how it works with the crab folks, at least. I don't know. I think Peter wants to be chair again when we have in-person meetings. <laughs> All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, shall we move forward? New chairman? Um, I'm good with moving forward. So item number five, uh, review of the 2020 Gulf Manhattan season of forecast. That's uh, Mr. Ray Morocco. Well, this is confusing. So am I going to be sharing from my screen or am I going to be asking you to advance, Steve? Um, I'm going to give you 
the power as soon as I display. Okay. There, and I am going to give you make presenter. Yes. Okay. So. I think it's probably going to be confusing. Now, can everybody see my screen? They're not seeing your screen. Oh, wait. Yeah. I need to. I see what we're doing. Yep. We're good. Okay. I should have so given you control of mine. This is fun. Okay. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ray Marock. Uh, I've already introduced myself, but I'm going to begin with the review of the 2020 Gulf Menhaden fishery, and then we're going to talk about the forecast for the upcoming season. Um, it's nice to hear all of you virtually, and I hope everybody's doing well. Um, <clears throat> so to begin with, we have the historical landings and the nominal fishing effort here for the Gulf uh, Menhaden fishery. And one thing that I wanted to point out, because it's going to be a little bit of a refrain that we're going to get into a little bit later, is that when we look here, this red line here is the nominal fishing effort. When you see the nominal fishing effort uh, it has been on a steady decline uh, since the 1980s, and we're at about the same level of nominal fishing effort that we were in the mid-1960s. Um, and so that's just uh, the way that things have gone. This isn't for any particular reason other than, you know, there's been consolidation of fisheries and all that kind of stuff. Um, this year, though, we have seen the annual landings decrease a bit, and we're going to get into that here on this slide. For the final landings for the 2020 Gulf Menhaden fishing season were 413,855 metric tons, or approximately 1.4 million standard fish. So as a change from 2019, this is a decrease of 15%. In 2019, we had almost uh, 487,000 metric tons. But it is an increase uh, over the previous five-year average. Uh, that was around 499,000 metric tons. Um, so uh, there have been a bunch of things that uh, have been affecting uh, the fishing season. So, for example, this year was uh, the year that we're talking about. I mean, 2020 uh, was the most active hurricane season on record, and we had the uh, unprecedented effects of the uh, COVID pandemic that affected everybody sort of universally across the board. Um, and then the participants in this Gulf Menhaden season, we had the same three factories in the northern Gulf of Mexico and Moss Point and Empire and in Abbeville. And to begin and kick off the season, it began in the you know winter. We had a warm, wet winter. We had a wetter than average spring. Uh, the snowpack up in the uh, Rocky Mountains that feed the river were sort of average uh, throughout the winter. So there wasn't really too much uh, to write home about with that. Uh, this year, however, perhaps because of all the hurricane activity, we had a below average Gulf of Mexico hypoxic zone. This is the third lowest since measurements began a little over 30 years ago. Um, and then I already mentioned the very active hurricane season that we had. Looking at tabular format here, the landings by month. You can see that April and May were, uh, April was rather low. Um, and then landings increased in May all the way through. We're at a little dip in July from the typical dome shape. Uh, shape of the graph. I was trying not to say shape again. Sorry about that. And then uh, in August, uh, landings picked up again. And then September, they decreased in the October and the you know, single-day landings that we had from the vessels coming back in November uh, were also a decrease. So look at this graphically. Um, one of the things that happened... Uh, Graphically here, we can see that, that April is rather low. Um, and in May, we had actually two preseason tropical cyclones form. Uh, they didn't enter into the Gulf, uh, but that was sort of unusual to have uh, preseason tropical cyclones. And the National Hurricane Center, uh, I'm hearing, is considering adjusting the dates of the hurricane season now because of the preponderance of preseason hurricanes or tropical cyclones we've been seeing. Uh, but the first one that affected the Gulf was uh, uh, crystal ball. It was the third main storm of the season. Storm of the season it formed over the Yucatan Peninsula and moved north. And uh, although it, you know, directly indicated the western portion of the Gulf of Mexico, it, it also uh, had some indirect effects on the eastern parts. And then uh, in July, we actually were relatively free of uh, tropical cyclone impacts in the Gulf of Mexico, with the exception.
exception of uh, Hurricane Hannah. And uh, that moved west and across into Texas. Um, then, uh, despite that, we still had the decrease in landings there in July. And in August, uh, we had <clears throat> Marco and Laura. Um, Hurricane Laura landed in, in Cameron. Um, but Marco landed first over right uh, directly at the mouth of the Mississippi River in August. Um, despite that, landings um, increased back to the average, the five year average. Um, then, when we had in September, uh, September is when we started to run out of some letters in the alphabet. So, we had Hurricane Sally uh, that sort of interestingly landed in the location and on anniversary. Uh, of Ivan's landing. And September landings here, um, probably due to the effects of these hurricanes and tropical storms that were impacting areas, we're still recovering from the previous one. We had uh, our lowest landing since 2008. And then in October, we had uh, more and more of our Greek lettered storms being named. We had Delta and Zeta both impacted the Gulf of Mexico there. So the Vessel participation that we had in 2020, we had 33 vessels uh, that fished here, and we had five run boats that uh, uh, recorded activity. So I don't have any record of the, the bait vessel down there in the Gulf of Mexico this year, so we don't have any <clears throat> record of their participation here, especially in the reduction fishery. Um, so we ended up with a, a nominal fishing effort of 265,200 vessel ton weeks for the year. Uh, in 2020, and this is a decrease of 13.6% from the 2019 value of 305,700 vessel ton week. Um, as you may remember from our last meeting, we had uh, our old Dell computer that was running on um, in DOS that finally irreparably broke on us. Uh, in the 2018 fishing season. So we began, uh, we had the microscope effort and the grants already in place. And so for the last couple of years, we have been having our, our poor aging technician uh, age twice the amount of sample that she's been doing. And she's put in a heroic effort here. And we have uh, completed the validation for the um, for the transition of methods, uh, the, the methods that we're going to be using with microscope have been shown to uh, not be significantly different than the previous methods that have been used uh, since the beginning of the Manhattan program. And we have uh, been able to begin the production aging process on that. So uh, as I've already uh, mentioned, Amanda has rather heroically gone to do all of this work. She's completed the age estimations for the Gulf of Mexico for 2018 and 2019. She's already begun on 2020. We have shifted and focused her efforts to make sure that she gets all of the data that we need collected for the upcoming stock assessment. So uh, the way things are right now, it looks like everything is wonderfully on track for us to be able to be ready to have all of this age estimation work done up to the terminal year of the upcoming stock assessment. And everything looks like it's smooth sailing from here. Uh, the result of our age estimation um, comparison study are actually in press right now. Uh, I believe that Amy has just submitted our last revision, so things should be moving forward on that. And as I'd already mentioned, the 2020 age estimations have already been started, and they will be finished for the stock assessment, and then everything will be caught up. So in October, and I'm hoping that uh, at some point during this year, we're going to be able to get back to the routine um, updates of the age um, percentages that we put out with the monthly report and with the summary of it at the end of the year. This has been a rather... Um, long and very complicated uh, process, what was the unexpected breakdown of the computer equipment, and then with the COVID pandemic that has caused this, uh, what's the word, very difficult shift to working at home, and then now we also have a, a, a reorganization um, thing going on with within the Southeast Fishery Science Center, so these things have all been very complicated, and uh, I appreciate everybody's patience on this. Um, so we move forward to the forecast here, or the, the review of last year's forecast. Our final landings, as I mentioned before, are 413,855 metric tons. And our forecast in, that I presented in March 2020 
had estimated 434,000 metric tons with 290,400 vessel ton weeks of nominal effort. So our actual landings were a little bit lower than that, 4.6% lower than the forecast. And we ran the hindcast for 2020 uh, with actual uh, nominal fishing effort for the forecast, putting that in there. It had estimated that we would have uh, 399,100 metric tons. And that decimal place there should be a comma. Sorry, I missed that. It was actually 3.7% higher than our, than our forecast. So um, when we move on to this year's forecast, we're expecting that we're going to have uh, the same number of factories. Uh, we're actually uh, anticipating one more vessel to be participating in the fishery. Um, and uh, we haven't counted out the bait boat yet, but um, the impacts of that are you know, extremely tiny. So we estimate that there's going to be 294,800 vessels per week in nominal fishing effort for 2021. And our point estimate here for the 2021 landings are uh, 424,500 metric tons. And this has an 80% confidence interval for that point estimate of between 307,000 uh, metric tons and 542,000 metric tons. Now, with this forecast, there are two things that can vary. We can have you know variance in the actual nominal fishing effort that we're going to see, as well as um, the efficiency of that nominal fishing effort. So because it might be a little bit more helpful to look at this instead of a point estimate to look at this graphically, uh, when we see that red dot or that red point in the center there, uh, that is our, our point estimate here. Um, and then when we decrease or increase the nominal fishing effort by uh, up to 10,000 uh, vessel ton week for the year, we can see a little bit of a spread. So we can see a spread here of between 300,000 metric tons and up to almost 550,000 metric tons. Um, so I thought that might help us uh, visualize and discuss the, the variance around this uh, for this year. Um, so now when we move on, uh, I will be submitting the forecast report that Steve has emailed out to everybody um, today that will be um, published on the Fisheries Market News website by the end of the week. I'll send that off to those people this afternoon. And then um, we have uh, the CDFRs, they're, they're at the printer. They're still waiting to get paid uh, for some of these, and then they will be shipped out as soon as I get those. Um, and then the guidebooks, I have to request permission to get into the building to go in to use our printer and our binding machine to be able to make those. And I'm anticipating to be able to get that permission to go in uh, sometime this week, so they should be sent out pretty soon. Um, and our port sampling for 2021 uh, we have chosen our port samplers. We've been lucky to retain the two um, for Empire and Moss Point. Um, but our port sampler in Abbeville has decided to move to Delaware for some reason. So uh, I have uh, chosen a successor for her. I interviewed her last week. And I'm going to send that information to you, Steve, so we can get the contract written up for that. Uh, the electronic reporting project that we have, I've received the tablets. I've programmed the tablets. I've been looking at the... Um, I've been figuring out the process for it and writing up and programming all of this stuff. They were planning to be deployed this year on my annual uh, trip to the Gulf of Mexico, but I wasn't able to make it last year. I also had it canceled on me this year. So when I had written this slide, I was told that the travel for this quarter was canceled, but I was recently informed that it looks like travel for the whole rest of the year is canceled. So I'm going to be setting up video conferencing with uh, our port samplers to do this. And I'm really excited about this. This is going to uh, reduce the time that we spend with data entry. And, and more importantly, I think it's going to reduce the error that we might have from some stubby pencil entry errors and fat finger errors when we're copying that stuff over to our uh, ones and zeros rather than the paper. Uh, and I think it's also going to uh, decrease the amount of time that we have uh, before we can start having some of our our basic analyses on uh, things for the week. So the port samplers will be able to send us the, the weight and link information directly, but we'll still have to wait for the, the slides to arrive in the mail. We haven't figured out a way to do that. And so that com completes my review of the Gulf of Menhaden uh, fishery for 2020. Uh, does anybody have any questions or want me to go back to any of these slides to discuss?
Are we doing questions now, or are we going to wait until the overall document? I'd go ahead and ask questions now. Okay. Yeah, it'll be easier for me to retain it. Go ahead. All right. So, I mean, we have this discussion seemingly every year, and, and you know, I, I feel like the industry, you know, still has a lot of questions about this forecast. Um, I, I think internally, we we view the biggest determinant whether we have a good season or a good bad season is typically weather and you know how do you chart the accuracy of the forecast versus the unpredictability of weather um i mean obviously covid is its own thing but you know how is that sure. factored into this with any reliability uh, it, it's not. We don't consider weather for the forecast, and that's one of those things that I was thinking would be one of the big impacts. So the the independent variable that I was considering putting into the forecast for some of the future things, you know, and I would, if we did this, I would still be running the forecast the way it's been done classically. Um, but I think when we're looking forward, I think I think that I agree with you. My gut tells me that the weather is probably going to be the biggest impact aside from you know nominal fishing effort and the state of the stock itself. Um, and so there's a, a topic that uh, that weather folks use that the meteorologists and the, the um, climatology folks use it's called accumulated cyclone energy. And so this is uh, a measure of how many days uh, we have hurricane force wind or maybe it's how many hours, but it's, it's basically a, a time function of how many we have hurricane force wind. The problem with using something like this for a forecast is it's not something that I'm able to get an estimate for uh, in time for our March meeting. So most of the National Hurricane Center, for example, usually publishes uh, something about its forecast for the upcoming hurricane season around in May. So that's obviously not going to be able to happen unless I get a DeLorean. But they have uh, some other... Um, groups that publish some things that look at some more rudimentary impacts of the upcoming hurricane season. They publish some things back in January or in December. And this is something that I was looking into using. It doesn't seem to me, though, that I'm going to be able to use something like uh, weather for my actual forecast. I could perhaps run something like that into an analysis to look to see how it affected the forecast at the end. Again, this forecast is the, the only two inputs we have here are the the historical nominal fishing effort and the historical uh, landings that we have there. And so for me to put something more into that, uh, especially something as unpredictable and, and, and finicky and, and difficult to predict as weather, it's going to take uh, a lot more work. And I'm probably going to have to consult with um, some weather people to do that. And I had a goal to do that this winter, but I really underestimated how, how much... Uh, much friction and how much drag there was going to be from COVID and working from home and things. So I only have the very rudimentary data collection for parts of, of that, that paper that I was setting up to look at this uh, to put out. Okay. Uh, well, again, I, I think it's extraordinarily difficult, but I think it does kind of throw in the, you know, the, the reliability of something that's, you know, if a variable like weather is not included, it really tosses out the reliability of the whole forecast. Um, but I think it's a good guide, so I appreciate your, your effort. Um, this perhaps is more of a question for you or Amy. Um, the the aging, you know, not having 18 or, or 20, 20 aging as of now, or those are critically important to the stock assessment. Are we confident that we're going to be able to get that aging data and then input it into the, the models for the assessment? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 2018, 2019 are complete. And uh, what has to happen, and I'm going to get started on, on this just about the minute after we get done with, with our meeting today, I'm going to start compiling that information and putting it into a format for Amy to use in the stock assessment that's coming up later on this year. 2021, or sorry, 2021 obviously has not been completed yet. Um, but the 2020 age estimations that we have, uh, Amanda's already started on that. Uh, I checked in with her last week. Uh, she's on track to be able to have this done with enough time for me to summarize that information and put it in the stock assessment. So the main focus that we have had 
uh, despite all the setbacks between the equipment failure and because of COVID and working from home and everything, we, we've, we've, um, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but we've done a really great job of, of collaborating and make sure and making sure that we're meeting everybody's needs, um, especially for the stock assessment. The stock assessment was prioritized over all the other work that we're going to be doing here because that's, you know, fundamentally our main, our main job here. And uh, one, not, not a question, but a, a request. I'll, I'll shut up after this. On uh, page three, when we talk about aging, would it be possible to add uh, a, a column for age three uh, landed fish? I mean, I know it's going to be, you know, somewhere between, you know, probably eight to 15 every year, but can we add a column for that? Okay, so you want it to be three and then four plus instead of three plus? Is that what you're asking? Are you talking about the uh, the forecast document that that he's going to submit? Yeah, like age composition on the page three of this forecast document, age composition of Gulf Menhaden in 2020, and you have age zero, one, and two. Can we get page three added to that top, to that table? Yeah, that shouldn't be too much trouble. On table one, I guess. Yeah. All right. So I'll do that. I, I think um, I think I was just you know following following the uh, the old format with that, and I I do believe that we have been seeing a little bit more of the H three stuff recently. So I think that that would be a good. Uh, addition. So thanks a lot for these comments. These are really helpful, and I, I really appreciate the feedback. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate your efforts on this project. I really do. Great. Hey, it's from Cattell. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. So I just want to check for accuracy. I think it's slide two or three. It compared to the five year average last year to the five year average. Okay. So last year we caught 113,000 tons. The five-year average is 498,000 tons. Surely that's a decrease. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's embarrassing. Thanks a lot, Francois. All right. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure history was correct. No, and you're right, and I, I, I even said the wrong thing, so thank you very much for that. That's embarrassing. Hey, Ray, I had a quick question. What is the main determinant of that 80% confidence interval around the point estimate? Uh, the main, the main deterrent, the... The main thing that goes into this confidence interval here, the main thing that impacted is the residuals uh, ar around our observed value. So whenever we're doing um, an estimate, the model is estimating um, that and comparing our estimated values to our observed values. And that is what can affect the, the, the spread of that confidence interval. Right, so this is based on all the forecasts and the actual landings from many years previously. Is that correct? That's correct. So what what goes into this is we input all of the nominal fishing effort and we input all of the uh, actual landings uh, going back to the beginning of the time that we're doing the forecast. I believe uh, the forecast started in the 1970s. Um, and then the the things that are compared, the things that go into this are the um, are those two things, and then it estimates um, the the trends for nominal fishing effort, and then it also uses the, that information to forecast uh, the expected landings for the upcoming year. Okay, and that solid line is consistent for every year. I mean, that it show show you know variation. In years past, was it higher than? Uh, was, was, did you have more confidence um, years ago, or or is it getting better? I'm trying to interpret that um, uh, that a blue line, if it should be a this blue line, line is this blue line is really just a, a spread of the upcoming forecast. So this is the Gulf Menhaden forecast 
Uh, so when we look at that red lot, that red dot center, that red dot in the center uh, is intended yeah. to be uh, our point estimate for our nominal uh, based on our nominal fishing effort. And then if we spread out over the range of nominal fishing efforts, we might expect to see if we increase that by 10,000 and decrease that by 10,000 vessel ton weeks. Uh, this is how the forecast point estimate would be moved along that line if the nominal fishing effort turns out to be different than what we are forecasting. And then in terms of the accuracy of the forecast, um, the the actual landings at the end of the year have typically been uh, less than 14% uh, different from what we would uh, what we had forecast at the beginning of it. So there are things that I'm you know, considering and, and looking at to see if we can do this uh, and make this forecast to be a little bit more um, of a narrower spread. But uh, the, the the fish and the weather don't always cooperate, and there's a whole lot of moving parts. And, and forecasting something like this is 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 um, phenomenally difficult to do more accurately than what's already being done. But I'm going to keep trying because. That's what I do, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hey, I just have one comment here. Yeah, just uh, just as uh, sort of clarification on this, it seems to me that uh, the issue is not the relationship between the vessel ton weeks and the the landings, which is pretty well known. And then uh, Ray put a slide up in the toward the top of the. Uh, presentation that had that pretty close relationship. It, the issue again is is the forecasting of the vessel time weeks, which um, it might could be refined for all the reasons that Ray was saying. But um, perhaps the industry, uh, because they really control what the vessel time weeks would be, as well as the weather, um, knowing how many boat boats are going to be in the water prior to the season. That kind of thing, that type of information, I think, would also help the forecast. Um, it may not vary, or even if it varied by five percent or so, um, that would that would be really uh, helpful to raise uh, forecasting ability of indeed what the effort will be for the next year, which is the thing that actually seems to be the most difficult thing to be forecast here. Thank you. Yeah, and that's a good point. And that's something that I'm not really able to to capture or get at in a really scientific way. Um, you know, one of the things that have happened is is both of the companies have changed ownership, and I'm I'm wondering if that might have some sort of impact on like the risk analysis they make on you know what type of weather days they're comfortable going out in, or or how many sets they're encouraging their their boats to make in a day, or how many days they're encouraging their their vessels to go out uh, every week. So these things. You know, may not be ca captured in the vessel ton week thing and this effort estimation uh, or our, um, you know, our, our, the way that I look at effort for this forecast is one of the variables that I was considering looking into for that. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry they don't have anything um, more substantial for that uh, forecast um, paper effort that I'd, I'd hope to have. But um, this, working from home is it, it's difficult in terms of collaboration i would be able to just walk down the hall to be able to talk to the people that i consult my statistics with and everything and now we have to arrange to text to make a phone call and then set up a google meet and stuff so things are things are that's this is something that i'm going to continue working on this is my next um you know big science effort here is, is on this forecast and look and see what we can do and and you know whether we can do what we want to do with it well i think you uh for my part I, it seems like you handled this the only reasonable way that you can is to put those confidence intervals around the prediction and uh think that that's seems very reasonable to me then perhaps it'll be up to the industry to figure out where <clears throat> where they might be on the vessel ton we uh Based on what their previous vessels were for the last couple of years, um, what their what their private forecast, their sort of sense of the sense of how the season might be, and then also the um, the error associated with the prediction itself. So, 
think that's really helpful. Can I make a comment or ask a question? Let's see. Sorry, Amy, go ahead. So um, there's sort of two pieces of this forecast, and I guess what I the question is really to the industry. So there's the point estimate that's presented, and that seems to be at least for this past year within five percent. And my I, my question is, you know, how close? Does industry want that to be? Because um, five percent, in my viewpoint, is fairly good for a forecast. Um, so that's one question. And then my second question is: Or is the concern more about the spread or distribution, basically the confidence intervals on that point estimate? Is it that you want those to be narrower? I think that's probably a bit more approachable, given some other data inputs. For example, weather was brought up. Um, I think weather might be able to improve um, or basically diminish the confidence intervals around that point estimate, but I'm not so sure that it's going to improve the point estimate itself. And so I guess my mm -hmm. question is to industry as to, I'm not sure exactly what you guys are even looking for. Um, I mean, I think that you know, the forecast clearly, you know, you know, predate at least my involvement with this committee. I think Joe Smith probably would be able to determine why they, they went down the path. It does seem that, you know, I, I don't speak for all industry, but I question, you know, when we have 20 percent interval confidence intervals on either side, Basically, you're projecting that it could be the worst fishing year or the best fishing year in, in years. And okay, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I don't think we have a necessarily a problem with the accuracy. It's, it's, it, it seems when it's right, it seems just to be kind of common sense that well, they're going to fish the same amount of vessels and weather to, weather is going to determine whether they harvest it or not. I don't know how instructive it is, frankly. I, I like them. I, I just like going through the numbers and the statistics involved. But in terms of its accuracy, it seems just to be um, kind of luck of the draw according to weather. Uh, yeah, that so I, I think I see what's going on. Go ahead. I was just going to say that makes sense. It seems to me that the interest here is really in the confidence intervals because, I mean, your statement of, Here's the mean point estimate, but it could be the worst or the best fishery <laughs> in the past 10 years Fishing is a valid yeah. point. Um, so, yeah, I think that that uh, and sorry to step in, Ray, but I just was thinking about this um, from my point of view. I, it just seems like that part of the question probably can be addressed with some further work. Yeah, and I think that that's a good point, and I, I certainly appreciate all these comments here, and, and one of the things that happened is I, I got kind of nerdy focused on accuracy, and it seems like we're talking about precision right now, and, and that's a, a subtle but important difference, and um, I can still keep working on this accuracy part, but I can work on uh, presenting a more precise forecast uh, here so that we won't say it's going to be either zero or something below infinity. And uh, those those are valid points, and this is good feedback. So uh, I appreciate all of these comments, and I really, I really do want you to know all of you know that I'm open to this, and I really do appreciate it. This is great. Um, so, so is, Robert, I think I recognize your voice, Robert. Are, are you suggesting something, uh, some input from the industry, say? A, a bi-weekly uh, number on Vessel Sun Week throughout the fishing season that would pick up the weather events that might uh, no, I think, increase the uh, vision? I think, I think he's looking at something to say, hey, we're really going to drive our folks hard, so we're expecting to do 20% more than we did last year in terms of effort, and, and that we might be doing something uh, a little bit less because... I don't know, fuel cost is more expensive or something like that. That's, that's I think, more what he's getting at, more of the upcoming expected uh, increase or decrease in the effort expenditure. Is that right, Robert? Yeah, it just seemed to me it was so, this, uh, the forecast was so, uh, since it was so 
heavily determined by what the fishing effort is for the season, that anything that could help inform what fishing effort might be would um, be able to influence the um, influence the estimate. But I mean, I think Amy really, uh, I think Amy and Ray, you guys hit the nail on the head there of the way that you might want to address this moving forward. I think it, it's from Cell, can I come in? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, just I'm speaking from Western, but I'm pretty sure that Ben and his team will support me. I certainly wouldn't have a problem, you know, early part of the January, February of the year, looking at what your calculation for us was for vessel ton weeks right. and saying to you, this is what we budget in for the coming year. Uh, and and I think we could do that company by company. And and uh, I think that would probably lead to some more accuracy on your behalf. January, February of the year. That's great. Um, this is Joe. Um, just a couple of historical uh, footnotes, maybe. Um, probably about Steve. I, I, you may remember this. Maybe 12, 15 years ago, industry asked us to look at a different unit of effort, uh, something other than the vessel ton week, and and we actually went into the CDFR database and and we looked at a couple other units. Uh, I. I they kind of escaped me now, but I, I think we looked at uh, uh, days vessels were at sea and made at least one set, uh, maybe days just at sea. And uh, I, I think we had three different units and they, they all, when we plotted those, it wasn't much different than the vessel ton week uh, we had been using since 74 uh, with data going back um, the other thing I wanted to note, and it, I think that the publication gets has gotten a little buried in the literature, but Doug Vaughn and a fellow named Peter Hansen at the Beaufort Lab put out a paper. Uh, they they looked at our forecast and and um, they used some different uh, some different variables, but they they sent all the data through a neural network and. Uh, it was pretty elegant and elaborate analysis, but in the bottom line was it, it wasn't much more much different than our historical multiple regression that we had done. So, uh, but that that paper is out there somewhere, Vaughn and Hanson. So, thank you. Is it is that H A N S E N or S O N? Uh, S O N. And, and and that great. Thanks, Joe. That that. Uh, that analysis where we looked at the different unit of, units of efforts from the Captain Daly fishing reports, I, I think that got, uh, that that's in one of the assessments somewhere, uh, prob probably uh, 05 or 06, somewhere back around then. But I, I, I know we, I know we included it in, 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 in one of the assessments. Yeah, and I um, recall a, a, a big effort conversation at the last benchmark, too. So that was going to be where I looked, too. But sorry, somebody else is chiming in? Well, can I can I interject something? Um, sure. As, a, as an outsider every year looking at the forecast, it, it sort of seems to me that what you're really developing is simply a matrix of if you have this much effort, Roughly, this is what your landings are going to be. It has nothing to do with what the availability of the fish is or anything else. Could you just create essentially a, a high fishing, low fishing matrix that would essentially give you the exact same thing? If you fish this many days, this is about with this many vessels, this, this is roughly what you're going to look at catching. And then if it, it's predicted to be a, a high storm season, you would obviously go further down the matrix to a different effort level. And if it's expected to be a, a La Nina cycle for a couple of years, effort could go up. You would just go higher up on the list because it really doesn't capture anything about the availability of fish or if they're going to be lean fish or fat high oil yield fish. 
it's really not much of a forecast. Oh, what do you mean? I did that but for nothing, nothing personal, but it seems to be getting to that point. Uh, there, was, there was just two columns of uh, uh, catch and effort that, that went into the, the regression. And, and I think Ray hit on it. Um, you mentioned that 14% on average over those 40 plus years, we've, we, we've done the forecast, or at least we have hindcasted. They've only been off on average about 14%. Now you, you miss a year where you, you've got a, a, a hurricane Katrina or you got a, 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 an oil uh, rig blowout 2010, uh, you know, you get, a, you, you're really off uh, by 30 or 40%, but, but on average 14%. So, yeah, I appreciate this discussion. I think that this is all really great grits for the mill. And I've written all these things down. I, I have, um, you know, let's look at some weather. Let's look at some other indices of effort. Let's try to figure out some sort of matrix in here. And then that was the goal for us to look at something like to see if the ENSO circulation had something to do with it. If we could somehow predict what the upcoming hurricane season was going to be. And we could put something like that in there where maybe with our, you know, fancied up multiple regression, we would find that phenomenal hurricane years typically reduce effort by, let's say, 20%. So we can have that spread that we have in our estimates of nominal fishing effort be pinned to something um, derived from the actual data rather than put in uh, a, a nice higher slash lower number and stuff. So these are all things that are that I'm, that I'm putting into the analysis. And I mean, these are all really great comments. Uh, and that would help with the accuracy, but with the with the precision discussion that it seems like is really the issue here, uh, that's a little bit easier of a change. And now that I now that I now that I understand exactly what we're looking at with the precision part of it, I can work on that. And I think that our next forecast, um, you know, could perhaps be a little bit more precise, but it might not be uh, any more accurate just yet. So, um, you know, I live to serve, and I'm striving to make this forecast to be useful to everybody. Um, and I got to use the data I have available to me. Um, and I, again, appreciate all this input. Yep. And it seems like, you know, as usual, Ray, you've got a lot of homework ahead of you for the next meeting. And we always appreciate what you're doing. Um, anybody else have any other comments on the side? We want to move to the next one. Well, I could, I could just hang out a little bit and have you compliment me a little bit more, Trevor. I'd appreciate that. Hey, I mean, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right. With no other comments. Let's go ahead and move on to the uh, update for the Atlantic and raise up again. Thanks, everybody. So, right, uh, can everybody when, right, right. Yeah. When you bring that, can you click the display settings and swap your your screen? What's happening? Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're seeing your uh, no. Don't be seeing my notes. So just yeah, but if you if you you show taskbar display settings, click your display settings button. <laughs> In that window, okay, I'm getting there. And you can swap the show view and the presentation. Okay, so you're saying I should go to settings here. That's settings. No, in your go ahead and bring it. It's in the uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry. Man, I was just feeling so good about myself. Now I feel like a doofus. No, you were fine. It's just we were, it was more difficult to see the the full image because we were seeing your preview and notes and everything. How's that? Share your screen, though. Oh, I thought it was. Screen one. How's that? Much better. Thank Great. you, sir. Thank you for the feedback. I didn't have any idea that I was showing you guys my hand. <laughs> so good thing we're not playing poker. Well, uh, all right. So thanks, everybody, for being patient. Thanks for the really great comments on the Gulf Menhaden fishery and forecast for this year. We're going to move forward to the 2020 Atlantic fishing season. 
Uh, so in 2020, um, we had uh, one factory still that was uh, working at a rebuild. Um, and so the coastwide allowable, the coastwide tax uh, was raised to 216,000 metric tons, uh, which left about 152,392 metric tons allocated for reduction. That's prior to the episodic set aside. Um, the episodic set aside was all caught this year, so there was none that was uh, uh, reallocated back to the fishery. And this is, I think, shoot, I'd written this down, but it's at least the third year in a row that that's happened. Um, and then when we look at the landings, we have 124,604 metric tons, which is approximately 479 million standard fish. And this is, I'm checking, it is a decrease from 2019 and from the previous five year average. So that is accurate. So we have a a decrease, decrease of 17.4% from 2019 and a decrease of 11.2 uh, from the previous five-year average there. Um, in 2020, we had uh, 10 uh, vessels from Omega Protein, or I should probably change that to Ocean Harvesters now, uh, that unloaded um, Atlantic Menhaden uh, for reduction in 2020. Um, we had one Virginia snapper rig boat, the bait vessel that also unloaded for reduction in Omega. And then one uh, vessel there that um, unloaded for bait only. And then uh, we also had, uh, I only have reports of the two uh, vessels that had reported uh, catch for, for bait in the Atlantic. So here we go. Uh, I was right, it was at least three, but we have the 50 year in a row that we had uh, large um, <clears throat> landings in the Northeast. The episodic event was declared for bait fishing. And so the bait fisheries in New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine all have uh, some uh, recorded participation in this episodic event this season. Uh, then for the fishery at large, we had uh, below average for the beginning portion of the year. Excuse me. And then after June, we uh, saw the landings increase to uh, pretty close to the five-year average for the rest of the season. season. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the exception of... Uh, Say that did a transect across the southeastern United States and came out um, in the Atlantic and in, in, in the mid-Atlantic states. We had relatively few direct impacts of the tropical cyclones on the Atlantic, but we had a lot of uh, indirect effects. So we had a lot of the um, a lot of the storms, especially when we got out to the Greek letters, that were uh, churning a lot offshore and, and cutting things up rough uh, for a while. So when I look at this, uh, our figure here. Nominal fishing effort in vessel ton weeks has been relatively stable. Um, sorry, I said vessel ton weeks, but I meant to say vessel weeks. Uh, and the Atlantic Menhaden landings have uh, been relatively close to the uh, total allowable catch limit. Uh, when we look at the landings by month, uh, we had. Um, In May, we had a relatively low landing. We had uh, off uh, <clears throat> Arthur that had happened offshore. That was one of our uh, preseason tropical cyclones. Uh, didn't impact Virginia directly, but we had some weather there. Uh, in June and July, we had uh, a relatively light uh, impact from tropical cyclones um, in the Atlantic this year. Uh, in July, we saw Hurricane Fay cross over and, and, and come out. In August, uh, the landings were um, affected by Hurricane Isaias that came and sort of swept north, uh, swept by us here in, in, in North Carolina, and then it moved north uh, all the way up into Canada. So that was one of those storms that was pretty persistent. And then in September and October, uh, the landings were uh, also um, starting to decrease there, uh, and we had a lot of offshore hurricanes in the, the Greek letter time period that were affected in October. And then our November landings uh, were a little bit lower than usual, and then November actually had, uh, or sorry, I said the November landings, and this, I meant to say December landings were uh, an increase over previous years uh, for December before all the vessels cut out in mid-December. So we have the same uh, slide here with uh, age compositions here. Um, another complication that we had uh, was because of COVID, our port sampler wasn't able to spend much time in the factory uh, in 2020. So there was a lot of 
uh, work that was being done, being done from home. So we have uh, some age samples there, and they are all the ones that are processed have been sent down to Amanda, um, and they are going to be worked through. Um, but again, we're prioritizing the 2020 stock assessment coming up. Um, and so the Atlantic, since their stock assessment is going to be starting for their uh, update is going to be starting for a little while, we're working on the Gulf first. So uh, to go through the coastwide stock, we've had uh, another benchmark since 2014, but I'm going to let a little bit more time before uh, pass before I, I delete the 2014 stuff. The uh, stock was not overfished, nor was overfishing occurring. So based on that and some of the update assessments, the uh, management board, uh, they established a tax, and then they raised the tax, and then they raised the tax, and then they raised the tax, uh, and they reallocated the adjustment, the allocation uh, from the tax uh, in 2018. Um, and that was uh, a thing so that everybody had a 0.5% allocation uh, based on previous performance. Um, and so in Amendment 3, they did in... Um, 2019, that cut the tax at 216,000 metric tons and that adjusted the allocation of the landing. And then we had the 2019 benchmark assessment. So we had both the uh, single species and, and multi species assessments that passed the um, peer review and then were used to implement it. And then recently, the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board reduced the tax for 2021 and 2022 fishing season by 10%. So that brought down the allocation for the Atlantic Menhaden here. Uh, the total owl of catch uh, prior to the episodic set aside is 192,456 uh, metric tons. And so that leaves about 136,253 um, metric tons for uh, reduction in Virginia. And so uh, this is going to be the um, allocation for this season and for the next season. And that completes the uh, Atlantic Menhaden update. So are there any questions about the Atlantic? No questions for Ray on this one. Looks like you got a break. Thanks. All right. And then next up, we got uh, Jason going to talk about Louisiana fishery independent side. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me set up sharing my screen here. Oh, I need the order. Uh, I got to. Yeah, I got to give you the permissions. Hold on one second. Give me the power. Uh, uh, I'm 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 making it so. I want to make you the presenter. Y'all got that screen? Yep. yep. All right. So uh, for those of you that have seen this for the past couple of years, uh, we do not offer a forecast or predictions anymore. And Ray, I feel your pain. I deal with trying to predict weather every year for snapper season. And I can tell you, you can only work from behind the eight ball. Um, so let's see if I can get this to advance. There we go. All right. Um, so these are our updated indices of abundance for Gulf Menhaden sampled in Louisiana waters. And we'll cover the indices for 16 foot trawls. And you can see the gear sizes there in parentheses, uh, our 50 foot bag seine and our 750 foot experimental gillnets. And, and those, as you can see, are composed of five pounds. So these uh, are same sampling locations. This is a map. Uh, ignore the old and new. It, it's all our sites. They're not separated in, in any manner. I just have not uh, updated these graphics to, to take out the colored dots. But it gives you an idea of when we expanded sampling, where we expanded to. Uh, and all the, all the gear maps will look like this. They'll indicate old and new. However, they're all the currently uh, sampled station. So when we look at the same, you can see that top graphic there is uh, 
a histogram of the size uh, that we get in the same. And this index is January through September only. Uh, just keep that in mind when you're looking at it. And so if you look at that index there, you can see it's uh, with that interannual variability there in, in the recent years, it has remained actually relatively stable. We've got some, some peak years. However, it's uh, and, and you can see there, they're all scaled. And so it's it's remained above one. Uh, trawl, moving on to that, these are the trawl locations you can see there. The trawl index, once again, the, the size up top, you can see that the size Manhattan captured in those trawl samples. And uh, once again, down at the index, you can see some, some recent high peak years, but still a, a relatively stable index, uh, up a little from last year. Gillnet locations. And then uh, for the Gillnet, because there are those five panels, you can see the, the size distribution of pop by the various mesh. And then you can see that index has actually been, been climbing uh, over the years, and this year's or the 2020 point is slightly higher than than last year's point. That's that's pretty much it. You all should have the document that gives a little more detail, and I'll I'll answer any questions. Hey, Jason. This is uh, Ben Landry. Um, in reviewing the, I guess your your uh, all of the work that the department is doing, do you have any challenges with? Um, I mean, did, did you see any trends occurring that would alarm you, or I mean, you're kind of the first line of defense uh, in terms of the data that's presented to the assessment that was PDFR. So I just didn't know if you if you had come across anything uh, interesting. Uh, nothing interesting to speak of. And as you saw with those indices, the, the Gillnet is actually trending up. The others are relatively stable. And of course, all this data will be available as, as soon as Amy wants it for the update assessment. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions, Jason? Yeah, this is yep. John. I have a question. So, Jason, you're showing your uh, index is going up for the Gillnet survey. I think in the past we've talked about this may be a result of loss of habitat where you have increasing open uh, water bodies. Is that a trend that's still continuing in Louisiana? I know y'all have spent a little bit of money trying to do some restoration. Yeah, a lot of that. a lot of money's been spent on restoration, and unfortunately, we're still we're still losing coast to, at a monumental clip. Um, and yeah, I, I know we've discussed this in a in the past, and it's certainly um, something to consider. Uh, is as as those areas become more open, are we seeing more Manhattan staying? inside the estuary and not necessarily moving uh, offshore as quickly until that biological urge dictates them to move offshore. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, I know we've looked at those sizes too and those ages and in those gill nets and um, I, I can't recall the trends in there, but, but I know it was, it was a pretty good spread of ages and sizes. Now, I haven't looked to see, uh, for example, we don't have age data in the 90s, but looking at sizes in the 90s versus now, I haven't done that analysis. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? I got one. Jason, are y'all? Aging those gillnet fish? Uh, we are we are not. 
we were that was part of uh, I believe it was Robert got those samples um, to to look at that for uh, prior to one of the assessments. But as far as continued aging, no, we are not. Okay. And we we have the ages for those too. But for this past year, Robert, or are you still getting samples? No, no, no. no this was, uh, I believe it was uh, 2016, 2017. Right, right. Okay. All right. Anything else for Jeff? All right, Steve, how do you want to work the break? You want to go ahead and take it or? I think we need to take it. Um, let's we're going to continue to stream this on the youtube but uh let's just do a uh about a five or ten minute break it's 9 50 central time why don't we come back in 10 minutes right at 10 o'clock that'll be 11 o'clock eastern sounds good all right thank you
My chronometer says 10 o'clock. Same, Zeus. We got everybody back? If you're not back, tell us. That's good. Dave's back. I'm not, I'm not here yet. Dave's not here, man. The good thing about being virtual is that I'm assuming that most of you are in your pajamas. Okay. And uh, if at some point I need to, I will turn off your camera. I'm just, just let everybody know I have that power. You're welcome. All right, want to go ahead and move forward with your item, Steve? I think we can go ahead. Um, we are uh, now getting ready to talk about the uh, the update for the stock assessment this coming summer. Um, I will give you kind of our timeline that Amy and I have, have discussed. Um, I guess everybody should see my screen. Let's see, okay. Uh, I love my timeline, makes it easy to kind of pinpoint where we are. So obviously, we're uh, here at the MAC meeting. We anticipate that the states should be able, we hope, to provide their uh, data through 2020 by June 1st to Amy. Um, she can go ahead and start cleaning that data up and putting it into the format 
I'm assuming that we're going to want it in the same format that we've done in the past. Um, there is a, a template spreadsheet. Um, I guess it's, it's your uh, Rosetta Stone, Amy, uh, with everybody's data. That's essentially what you want updated. And then we will, in June and July, have a couple of conference calls potentially to address any of the, the questions about the data. Um, again, in August and early September, we won't have a necessarily a formal uh, data workshop type meeting, uh, but we will, that's what those early calls will be just to kind of clean up the data. If there's anything that we need to discuss about adding for sensitivities, um, this is going to be not a benchmark. It's going to be an update. Um, this is within the, the commission's process, not CDAR. We have some flexibility, but at the same time, uh, I think we're considering this effectively, you know, for lack of a better term, the turn of the crank. Um, we're going to update the indices and run the model again. I, I don't know that we're going to even use uh, a second model. Um, historically, they always seem to align very well, so there's probably not a need to uh, delve into that. We'll have an, a preview of the assessment in, in that August and September timeline. Um, get a look at the base run, talk about some of the sensitivities, um, make any adjustments, and uh, we'll try to get a draft report together sometime in September in advance of the uh, October meeting. I'm hoping that it will be no longer virtual. Uh, if that's the case, if NOAA is allowed to travel despite uh, the current uh, news that we got from Ray that it looks like travel through the year is not going to happen, either virtual or in person, we will have uh, a presentation of the assessment that will be presented to the TCC uh, for their review, and uh, and then we will go ahead and finalize the update uh, shortly after our October meeting. So that's sort of the schedule, the way that we see it. Uh, Amy, is there anything that you want to add as far as your needs or or uh, how you see this progressing? No, nothing to add really. Um, all of the data that are coming out of Beaufort should be ready in time. Um, I assume that the state data can be ready by June 1st to be provided, but it'd be nice for folks to speak up now if they think that won't be the case. Um, I also know that some you know, for us, we have um, surveys and things that didn't run in 2020. Um, so if that's the case, um, that's still okay too. Uh, we may have to figure out in June um, what to do with that, um, if there's some big impacts, but um, that's pretty much it. I know some folks have already expressed some interest in running some things as sensitivity runs for this assessment. That's sounds like great to me so that's about it uh, hey Steve just a quick question so who who is uh, kind of sits on this stock assessment subcommittee uh, Amy I assume you're the chair uh, or the lead on the assessment who who else is going to populate this from outside of the state just what's the universe look like Not sure if Steve heard the question. Steve, you still there? His screen says he's been cut off the phone. Hold on. Well, I can. I mean, traditionally, who's been on the assessment committee has been the state 
reps and Ray and I and Robert. Um, but I'm not sure like formally who's included. So I think Steve should answer that question when he does get back on the call. No, and, and that's fine. I, yeah, I, I, I think the, the state biologist and your team at NOAA, um, you know, plus some, some of Robert's expertise is certainly a good, a good team to work on this type of work. Amy, was um, was Joe Ohop a part of the um, process, the assessment process, uh, when you guys did it the last go round? No, well, was he? You're testing my memory here, Chris. <laughs> well, he just retired last month, uh, and so, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm on here because I took over for him. Uh, so. Yeah, I think he was, because <clears throat> Bezad was at one point, and then he retired, and then I think Joe was. Okay. So I assume you're the replacement. Yeah, I'll just uh, double check. Okay. To enable audio control, please enter your audio pin followed by the pound or hash sign. We're hearing you beep in. Okay, I'm in now. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I have no idea what happened. That is the weirdest thing. It just cut us out. It literally, it hung up Debbie and me, probably Joe. Very strange. Did Dave pay so, the bill? Yeah, well, I don't know. We've got, our stuff is all through a, uh, it's voice over internet. So there may have been a hiccup in our, uh, in our network system. Um, I heard, Amy, I apologize. There was you, you, you were stating something, no, uh, um, and then I got cut off. Yeah. So basically, we just talked about. Um, well, Ben asked asked a question to you, basically, and it is that um, who is formally included on the uh, stock assessment subcommittee for this process. And my recollection was it was um, the state representatives and then myself, Ray, and Robert Correct. in the past. And, but I wanted you to chime in that, on that. You can get back on. It, the yeah. dial-in is now working. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's correct. Basically, um, the state reps are providing the, the data portion. Um, in the past, we have invited a few extra people. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now from Texas. Um, help me out, Amy. Well, we've had Jerry and Fernando. Jerry? And, uh, yeah, and of course, having Robert. Jerry Gelby? Doesn't it carry Gelby? Well, Carrie is our current rep, but in the past we had Fernando also. Um, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Sat in as a as a stock assessment person, um, and, and generally we've got a pretty smart crew. Um, so between between those who are participating out of the subcommittee and and a couple of others that we invited, we generally covered um, most of that ground that way. Um, you know, and all that's good. I, I, the reason I ask is, you know, we've been getting some nonsense saying that the industry runs these assessments and just wanted to clear that up. Uh, 
the industry, frankly, is, other than providing CDFR, doesn't influence this process at all. So just wanted to have that cleared up on the record. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I had not heard anything about accusations like that. I think it's pretty clear when you look at the report um, who the participants are, plus we have all the minutes and, and we, we pretty much summarize everything that we do. It's as transparent as we can make it, trying to follow in the same same way that CDAR is done. Um, the benchmark was done through CDAR, and we're doing the updates through the commission's process, but it, it's it's pretty reflective of, of the same process. Uh, we don't have the CIE reviewers uh, for the updates. It's kind of overkill if we if we do something like that, because these are these are pretty straightforward when you've got the BAM model or you're also running ASPIC. Um, you know, turn of the crank, it, it, it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't deviate significantly. We're not doing something that would be challenged, I think, in most situations without going through a benchmark. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much state driven. Was there anything else related to the timeline? Uh, did anybody respond whether, uh, I mean, I think that's part B here, is the state progress, what the expectations are. Uh, again, terminal year for the assessment, we're looking at 2020. Um, the uh, port samples, I would hope, would be done. The 2020 port samples would all be processed. Um, I know we've gotten all of the freezers emptied. All of the scales have been pulled and sent to, to Amanda. So it's just a matter of reading and, and, and getting all those ages. Is that right, Ray? That's correct. And Amanda's on track to have those all done. So we're on track there. And the CDFRs, you've still been getting those. And uh, so I think, I think it really falls to the states, the fishery independent data. Um, those are the data streams that we need to make sure that we have the, the gill nets and the um, same data. Hey, Steve, this is uh, John Moresco. We have been aging the menhaden out of our, our gill nets. Is that some information that uh, AB is going to be interested in for this assessment? Amy, is that going to be something you're interested in for this assessment? This is well, aging of the fishery independent inshore samples. From the yes. gillnet. So the Alabama and Mississippi gillnet were not used in the base run, if I'm recalling correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know we did include them in a sensitivity run in the last assessment. I think Robert worked on that index. Um, That's if we, I know this has been brought up, so we could um, look at it as a sensitivity um, moving forward and we could have a discussion about that. And I know, so Robert, you've mentioned also you have the ages from the fishery independent sampling. That also wasn't included in the benchmark assessment, but you know, should be something we at least look at as as sensitivity run, in my opinion. So. Yeah, we can uh, provide that, I mean, uh, no problem. I think, John, the answer is, it would be nice to look at it at least for a sensitivity run. Okay. And I'll I mean, the that. commission has the purview to, you know, sort of say what we do or don't do with the base run. Um, given this is an update and not a benchmark. So I think it probably will end up falling to a discussion of the committee as well. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything about the, the sheet that you sent me or? John? No, uh, if she's interested in it, then, uh, you know, we can discuss it uh, later on a webinar. We're just yeah. gonna okay. Uh, 
when you started asking questions of Louisiana had been aging their uh, information, I decided I would send you that uh, information, but I don't think we need to discuss it at this point. Okay. Can I ask one question? What are you aging with? Uh, Aberbach, a scope, microfiche? Um, we're aging scales and otoliths, and we're doing it on the microscope. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I guess, Trevor, are you guys doing anything with aging your fish in Mississippi? We are not. Uh, we're just still collecting the same way we have been and getting the detailed links and everything else. I did have one quick question for um, Amy and Robert. You know, it's been you know, a few years since we've done this. And we've had a fair amount of, of shuffling, uh, especially within our bureau. Is there a specific format? Um, Y'all might want this data delivered in, or is the way it was submitted last time, will that suffice? Um, that way I can just let our, our data folks know what they need to do. Personally, I would be happy to see the data submitted exactly as it was submitted last time. Like in the exact order the variables are in and everything. If you can get it exact, that would be great because the bit code is set up to pick up the file that was provided last time and modify from there. So sometimes what happens is the code comes in and things are out of order or um, it's just structured differently. And so we have to revamp that part of it. But if it comes in exactly as it did last time, that makes life much easier. Uh, and I, I think I dealt with it last time, so I'll be able to get that to them. Thanks for that. Thank you. So, Amy, is that what was in the data workshop master file? No, I don't think so because I sent you. Are you talking about the data file for what goes into the assessment dat file? Right. Yeah, yeah. No, because I'm. We're talking about raw data. So the raw data they've provided in the past. I hope it's mostly the same folks that are on here. You know, they have the what they've sent, it would be nice if it was the same because basically the raw data comes in and then it gets processed into an index or whatever else. And then it got put into, you know, the, the process data were put into that data work book, which is what goes into the DAT file for the assessment. And I think that's what you have because I don't think that I sent you any raw, raw data. Okay. So I guess we do have a couple of new reps. Carrie, um, is that something that you inherited from Jerry and have access to the old file to, to know what needs updating? Well, I'm going to need a little guidance on that. Um, I can reach out to Jerry and Fernando if he sat in on, on these state rep meetings previously. Um, I Texas. assume you are. I'm sorry. I was just going to. Texas, we didn't use, so I don't need. Okay. So don't In even Florida, request. I got it. Florida, we didn't use, so I don't need either. It's really Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. Okay. That's right. So I guess that we have the consistency there, so we're probably good to go. And I think in the past, Mark Fisher, is that the right folk out of Texas who provided data? I think that's who I've gotten stuff from in the past. Yes, Mark. Yep. Um, market pulls uh, he handles most of the the, the data pool things our agents we don't need him to do any extra work this time so that's good yep. okay so if everybody thinks 2020 is reasonable to have that data proofed and cleaned and updated to amy then that's going to keep us on that schedule uh which will put us in a lot of conference calls over the summer. Uh, if travel does open up and it warrants having some sort of face-to-face, -face, I mean, that would be an option, but I really don't see that happening as it's just an update. Um, but I would very much like to have a face-to-face -face in October. Um, if everything goes well and all the vaccinations work, um, Hopefully we'll be able to to hold that meeting again and uh, 
and actually look at something tangible instead of doing these webinars, which I personally really do not like. Um, if there, are there any other questions about the update itself, what the plans are moving forward? Yeah, Amy, just so just to be clear, so you said Florida data wasn't used, so I don't need to submit anything to you because I that explains why I can't find any data sheets uh, that may have been submitted. Yeah, Florida, Florida typically doesn't specify by species, right? They just go to the genus level. And so we weren't able right. to use Florida data yeah. historically. Right. Okay. I just wanted to uh, double check. Yep. Yeah, you also have a lot of overlap of species, which is why you, you don't speciate quite to the to that level. So yeah. Right. Yeah. I know we get that on the uh, Atlantic a lot. Um, so I assumed as much for the goal. Yep. Uh, anything else on that uh, with the updates and all that information? And we're good to not use the aspect run. Everybody's okay with that. Excellent. All right. The next the next thing I've got on there is the reference points and the harvest control rule development. Um, prior to the pandemic in 19, we spent a lot of time, uh, a couple of meetings, uh, going through the exploration of potential reference points. Um, a lot of work was done with Butterworth and company doing the potential control rules. Um, just to kind of give you all an update, that was delayed, obviously. Um, Pandemic has not helped us there, uh, but I think that in the background, the industry has been talking still. We hope to revisit that. So as of right now, there, there won't be any changes to uh, potential management based on any of that uh, work that we had, we had been doing. The assessment will We'll see where we end up with the uh, the reference points that come out of the assessment update. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way to move forward at this point. There are some additional ecosystem modeling efforts going on. Uh, Dave Shigaris and um, Skyler and, and the folks who've been working on a lot of those models are still in development. They're they're nearing real time, uh, ready for prime time kind of uh, exploration. I don't know if that's going to be something we're going to pursue in sensitivity. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I've really not gotten a good sense from Dave Shigaris that that those were as far along as maybe we had hoped. So if anybody else has any insight or thoughts on it, um, as far as I know, that's where we stand with, uh, with the ecosystem modeling. Steve, this is Amy. I, <clears throat> my understanding was that there was a hope to maybe include something from that as a sensitivity run for this update, just as like a exploratory look at possibilities. Um, but you're right, I haven't checked in with Dave recently, um, so it might be worth just, I can shoot him an email and see where he's at with that. Um, yeah. Well, he and I had part of this meeting when I was developing the draft uh, agenda, and uh, he did not come back with anything really being ready to add, at least as a preview for the agenda. So until... I hear from him that they've got something more formal if by June um, we don't have that ready. Uh, I'm thinking we just don't worry about it. Um, they know what the process is and they know my schedule. So uh, I'm going to leave it up to them to, to sort of determine when they're ready. But yeah, please reach out to him. See if, see if he's got any kind of an update that, that might help. Sure. Sounds like a plan to me. 
Anyone on the harvest control rules and reference points? Crash, boom, bang. All right, Mr. Chairman, shall we move on? I, am I unmuted now? Go ahead. You're unmuted. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the harvest control rule. And uh, so uh, I'm getting an echo here. Uh, you're going to have to mute one of your, either uh, mute your computer completely, turn off your speaker. And you're still on the phone too? All right, I unmuted my computer and I muted my phone. Oh, mute. Unmute your phone and mute your computer. You there? When I do that, you can't hear me. That's strange. Okay, well, right. let's deal with the. Can you hear me now? I turn my phone off. Yes. Oh Jesus Christ! We can hear you. Yes. Let me call back in. No, you're good, Theo. We can hear you. I I think that we can hear him, but maybe he can't hear us. Yeah. Six boards there. You can hear me now? Okay, so I won't dial in again. I can't hear myself. Okay, so let, let me give you a big uh, little background on the harvest control rule. And the reason um, the, the year one client action plan is due April 22nd for the Gulf MSC certification. And so I've had to reconstruct the, uh, the meetings and the documents that go back through uh, January of 2019. And it started with the uh, Butterworth Rademeyer uh, document. Um, I got to present all this in the client action plan. So we had, uh, we had two excellent uh, workshops with the, uh, the, the commission and uh, we proceeded um, into the fall. And then uh, it seemed like the system came to an abrupt halt. And I have a document from the MAC conference call agenda in January of 2020 uh, requesting IJF funding for the um, essentially the uh, a data, a, a data portal to operationalize Doug Butterworth's uh, algorithm. And I have a project proposal from Robert. And when the IJF money uh, went to the states from the commission, uh, we, that, we, we lost our funding opportunity for that particular um, data portal that I think is essential to moving forward with the uh, harvest control rule work that was started by Butterworth. So I think uh, where we're at is that uh, we have to figure out some kind of a funding mechanism for the for the readily uh, access of the fishery independent data to generate the index, which is the foundation of the harvest control rule. And uh, we don't have that that funding source yet. And I think it has brought, I, I can't blame everything on COVID, but I think it brought our, um, our, our progress to an abrupt halt. So on MSC, um, and I'm talking about agenda item nine now, um, that's where we stand with the harvest control rule. And I would, you know, I was a little disappointed to read in the minutes from, from uh, September of 2020. And it took, well, when I brought up about the FMP and then we went to the species profile discussion, et cetera, et cetera. 
And it says emphatically, MSC is a marketing tool and not a management issue for the states. And I wonder if that's entirely true because when you're talking about a harvest control rule based on the fishery independent data, this certainly seems to me to be a, um, a management uh, program. And um, maybe, maybe we could have a conference call amongst the states to see if and how we could uh, fund. I, I think it's a proposal by Robert and Doug um, it's called Operationalizing Determination of Stock Status for Sustainable Management of the Gulf Menhaden Stock. So I don't know where we go from here, but um, I'd sure like to hear some suggestions. And I got to call in on my phone again because I can't hear anything from my computer. You can't hear us right now? So that's it for me. Okay. So we'll give we'll give Peter a second to to call in. Um, I really don't want to respond to that until he's able to hear the answer. Um, as as a little bit more background to that comment regarding the um, regarding the issue of it being a marketing tool more than anything um, that was that was a comment that had actually come back from either the TCC or the commission I can't remember exactly where that is okay are you back there Peter okay yes. so the, the the marketing tool comment was I believe the context was uh, in relation to the, uh, and it may not have been the TCC, it may have been the commission itself in the, in the report that, that we gave to the commission to the state federal. Um, essentially, MSC is a certification of a product, product to show that it is sustainably fished and managed. And the opinion of that was presented there, Peter, was that that is a marketing tool to demonstrate sustainable management and responsible fishing practices, which the states and the assessment already says and shows is ongoing. So it does, it's not a tool to improve the management that we currently have. It was a tool to show how well our management is currently going. And from that perspective, it was not as important to the state agencies to mandate something purely for certification purposes. I believe that was the intent of that comment. And therefore, you know, the, the, there's, that's why I think there's, there's generally some resistance to make grandiose changes to management simply because there's nothing warranted biologically at this point. Well, doesn't the harvest control rule react to the condition of the stock as predicated by the fishery independent data that go into the Waterworth uh, MSE model? Well, oh, absolutely, but I think that the the harvest control rule is intended to deal with extreme circumstances. I can't remember what the term was. Uh, yeah, Robert, you're probably more familiar. It, for the the annual routine variation in the population, unless there is some extreme decline or a extreme increase in effort something else going on that it, it generally is is massaging where that that line is and I think everybody was comfortable with the harvest control rule because it really only addressed extreme circumstances um, 
which we just have not seen. Uh, so, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if we're, I, I can't speak for the state agencies. I just, I'm trying to recall back to the general discussions, um, and kind of what, um, we kind of pulled together out of that general discussion was that if the state agencies weren't, did not feel there was a need to adopt something like a harvest control rule, that the industry could certainly do that in order to continue their certification process and addressing the client action plan. Uh, and that was essentially where we left it. There was no yeah. going to the agencies and discussing further why you have the need for this um, and if that was going to be something that was going to be negotiable with the with the agencies as far as management goes. Self-imposed management is a great thing, but they have to be on board and have a reason why. Um, and biologically, yeah. I don't know that there was a reason yet. So it was falling to the industry to pick up that, that torch and carry it to try to get some forward momentum on it. And I, I don't think that we ever really got any further than talking about that part. Right. So I, I, I hate to put Robert on the spot, but I, I thought that his um, web-based data portal uh, yes, it would certainly accommodate the Manhattan Fishery Independent Data Sources, but I thought that ultimately it was envisioned more on a Gulf-wide, um, a, a, a tool that other fisheries throughout the Gulf could use for other fisheries. And in that sense, uh, it could be something that could be beneficial to the Commission. My, did I miss that, Robert, or uh, am I overstating it? I think the overstating it just a little, Peter. We had um, we had kept it pretty narrowly focused on Gulf Menhaden. I mean, I guess we could have some if we were to try to propose this to a funding agency, because I think that's really what we must do in the future is try yeah. to propose this to some federal funding opportunity. Then. We probably would want to make some statements about making it, um, making it a larger taxonomic base, but um, we were in the scope that we had originally talked about in the narrative that I and uh, I had written and that um, um, that you had seen. We were really talking about um, both Manhattan. I mean, because for for the exactly for the reasons that you guys have been discussing, is that the, uh, the harvest control rule. Is uh, is completely based on the um, the fishery independent data sources, the information coming out of the fishery independent surveys. All right, so industry will likely have to carry the ball and find a funding source to generate the data portal to continue work on the harvest control rule. Is that a safe statement? Well, um, you know, as as uh, funding opportunities present themselves, um, we can certainly work collaboratively to do that. I think that that's probably that's probably how it will go down. I mean, when we see, when I see, or Steve brings to my attention some uh, funding opportunities, then we'll we can work yep. together to pursue them, and then certainly any funding that you can secure on your side, it is very much. Um, it, an effort that the stakeholders of the Gulf Menhaden fishery are most concerned with. Um, so it's, it's not unreasonable that you might want to find some money as well somewhere through whatever channels you have. Can I ask one final question? Uh, is, is this uh, this tool that you're envisioning, is, is this something that you and Doug Butterworth would develop jointly or is this totally your, your concept? No, uh, the uh, the narrative that I had written, I just call it sort of a pre-proposal. Um, Doug and I were back and forth on it. I think there okay. we still need to talk out some ideas about it, but um, I know he would want to be involved in anything that came up, that, you know, that we that we had that we could do. I mean, it's he. We talked about it at the workshops. Is that 
this would need to be operationalized to some extent. And since he was so, he was the primary mover in the workshops, I'm sure he has an interest to be part of this in the future. Okay, so that's where we stand on the harvest control rule, and probably that's the update on the MSC. Um, a client action plan is due April 22nd, and uh, as I said, we had a number of great workshops funded by the commission, and we'll have to uh, re-energize our process, I guess, in year two. So uh, that's it, Steve. Well, Peter, I, I, I want to go back to that funding issue. And, you you know, you guys had submitted as uh, proposed work uh, to be prioritized under those IJF funds that were made available to the states. Um, yes. That money is still available and going to the states. If, if I understand you that. guys yeah. feel strongly that that is something that is beneficial to the states, you are certainly encouraged to talk to your state reps and see if that is something that a little bit of that money could be carved out to cover some of that, if, if that's the way that you want to proceed. I do not have the ability to do that. The states would have to make that determination in amongst the stuff that they are also prioritizing. Um, so it's not a dead issue, but that's going to be something if you want to if you want to work with your with your two main agencies and, and see if that's something you can have happen, um, uh, that is still, I think, a, a reasonable funding source for that project. I don't see it being a huge, expensive project. Um, it right. may be worth pursuing that that way. So that's that's the best that I can offer as far as our original intention with the IJ funds. Um, they're still on the table, but it falls to you guys to, to follow through with that. Okay, we'll do. Any more discussion on the, these points? Eight and nine? If not, we can go ahead and move forward to Francois. Yeah, hi, sorry, I just had to unmute. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, so um, the uh, the NOAA Bycatch Steering Committee, which is looking at protected marine mammals, had uh, five, I think it's five steering committee meetings. We're still trying to settle on how we are going to observe the boats and and the fishing activity, uh, we seem to be settling on a, what is known as an alternative platform as one of the first things we need to do in this coming season. So to take two or three NOAA representatives out on an alter alternative platform and to go and view fishing activities for a week or so. Um, NOAA is working through some regulations and policies that they have to see whether or not, one, they will be able to travel, two, if they got an al on an alternative platform, whether they would be able to move from that alternative platform onto steamers or first boats. Uh, and uh, so they're working, the no observers are working through that. Uh, they also have been in contact with uh, a provider of cameras that are suitable in the marine environment and have got various proposals on cameras and we'll be working to look at how we could locate cameras to possibly monitor setting activities or pumping activities. And, um, and the last thing that uh, is being looked at is the potential use of drones um, to observe a setting activity. Uh, there is a concern, obviously, because by definition there are spotter planes in the air in the vicinity of our flight, um, but certainly I think <clears throat> Ray's in charge of this program. He sort of indicated that they would be keeping those drones at below 100 feet 
Uh, and so the idea would be, I believe, is to try and take a drone pilot out as one of the original ideas on the alternative platform sometime this season uh, and to see whether or not it's practical or not to fly a drone and whether that collects any valuable information. But I file a disclaimer, it's all subject to NOAA's uh, permitting people to travel. That's really where we're at. Thanks for that. Anybody got any questions for Francois? Um, uh, so if they do an uh, alternate platform, just means another boat, would that be another industry boat that would be going out on? Or they try to contract out somebody else? So I've offered a boat that we use at the moment just to see whether or not it works. Uh, and that'll be the first, first, I think we talked about a week of sort of observer activity. And, uh, and it's an ex-Coast Guard boat. Um, and depending on how that works, I suppose it'll be discussed at the steering committee going forward. All right. Any questions or any comments on this one? Seeing none, we can move on to other business. So we've already got one item in there. We can cover it. The Simpsons funded project, Robert. Sorry, Robert. I volunteered you. Okay. Yeah. yeah I see that. You're um, going to do something. Okay. Yeah. Very so uh, just for. Very briefly, uh, we have this um, uh, some money from uh, SEMPIS, uh, NSF SEMPIS partnership uh, to use the archived marker capture data to uh, estimate uh, total mortality rates uh, for the fishery for the period or for the for the stock for the period for which we have the data. It's looking like our most robust uh, time period is like 1977 to 1987. And um, we'll have uh, a report on this and some preliminary work to show uh, at our April uh, SEMPIS meeting. Uh, just to alert this group, I have a student, uh, a master's student, Catherine Wilhelm, who has been often on this call. Um, and I'll introduce you at that time in April to her. Um, she's really excellent. And um, so we've been working hard on that. And um, stay tuned for updates. Awesome. And I think if I remember correctly, that's going um, to knock out one of the research recommendations from the last assessment, right? Yeah, one of the, one of the high priority research uh, Good deal. Uh, is there any other, anybody else, any other business, any other items? Uh, just as a point of housekeeping, uh, we've had a couple of people jump on the call who I'm not entirely sure who they are. If you want to introduce yourself, if you did not introduce yourself before, uh, feel free. We have uh, somebody listed as CJC. Can I hear you? Okay. Uh, Chad Gordon. Come again. Chad Corville. Okay, who are you affiliated with? I was a wildlife and fisheries commissioner, but interested in Gulf Menhaden. Excellent. Welcome. Uh, anyone else who didn't get introduced before? Okay. Uh, the only other thing I am going to, uh, I have a magic eight ball and I'm going to make my prediction based on it. We will have a face to face meeting in October. The eight ball has said so. So it looks like we're going to be meeting in Florida, the meeting that's been put off twice now. Um, stand, stand by in the summer and find out where that's going to be in Florida. But uh, I am confident that COVID is behind us and, and we can actually meet in person. So uh, looking forward to seeing everybody again. Absolutely. That's April has spoken. 
Um, I don't, I don't believe there, I have anything else. Um, Mr. Chairman, we'll get a, a, a summary together for you and you're going to deliver the, the report at the commission business meeting on Wednesday, the 16th, uh, in, in the afternoon, if that's still good for you. Oh yeah. Sounds good. All right. All right. With no other business, do we have a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All right, Jason, moved. Second. I'll second. This is Ray. All right, Ray, second. Perfect. Before we adjourn, um, I guess I just I wanted to say how excited I was to see Joe Smith. Uh, Pantheon Menhaden Regulator uh, on the call. Great to see the face of good show and I uh, wish you all the best. Uh, good to see you all again and to hear your voices and uh, come see us in North Carolina sometime when this COVID stuff's all over. Yeah, I agree, everybody. Come Sounds good. I hope everybody who's been able to get vaccinated is doing so and uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. This is going to this is going to be available on our YouTube uh, for perpetuity. And I will I will make all of the presentations and everything.